Hello there, this is Linda Hill and it's the uh, 3rd of September 2015 in the United States at the moment as I'm making this recording. And it is uh, Elsie Willer's birthday. And I think I uh, sort of only just obliquely worked it out. I think she's 128 today. So, you know, in celebration of Elsie, I really felt that it would be a nice idea to have a look at her chart and describe what, uh, you know, some of the aspects and the amazing things about Elsie because she's really um, uh, the most amazing woman and I'm really, you know, someone who has researched her life more than anybody I think uh, has ever done and uh, I find her to be an incredibly interesting woman. So, you know, uh, looking at the Sabian symbols, you always add one to the degree of the actual degree of a, a planet or point. And Elsie Wheeler's sun degree was the 12th degree of Virgo, even though in her chart it says um, uh, 11 degrees and 16 minutes of Virgo. That means that she's on the uh, Virgo 12. And that is a, a bride with her veil snatched away. And... Um, Elsie's life was so incredibly interesting uh, in so many ways, it's uh, not funny, but she, so she was a bride with a veil snatched away, but she was never a bride, you know, she didn't marry, and so marriage was an issue in her life, and uh, yeah, so she obviously had a, a relationship, it seems, with a man called Frank Baxter, who she lived with for quite some time uh, in San Diego, uh, you know, she, she had a very uh, difficult life to start with. Well, actually, I think her whole life was uh, the type of life that none of us would really want to trade uh, with her. Too difficult, too hard, and too uh, ill for so many years with rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, she was confined to a wheelchair from the age of three, so it goes, and uh, from what I've been able to find out. And uh, she was sent away to St. Louis when she was really little. But um, it's, it's a bit... I'm going to be looking more into it, and I'm not sure whether she was sent away to St. Louis before her mother died, when she was like four or five, or whether it was after that. Um, her mother died uh, when she was about four or five, and then her father died um, a couple of years after that. I haven't been able to find out what uh, the parents died from. Um, I have a funny feeling it was sort of like a flu, you know, some sort of influenza, but um, I haven't found that out. I've tried, uh, and I haven't got the answer to that as yet. I do believe that the answer might be there, though, in that courthouse in southern Illinois where she was born. But the thing with the bride, you know, the thing with the bride with Elsie, I think, you know, it's the bride with the veil snatched away. You know, the story is that in order to, uh, in, in order to commune, in order to commune with someone else, we really need to remove our veil, you know. We need to uh, be able to look them uh, directly in the eyes without that veil that covers us, so, you know, because the veil can cover our identity. The veil can um, make it difficult for us to see into other areas. And so, you know, there's, um, I must look this up, but I think it's the gospel according to Philip uh, where it said that in order to enter into uh, the bridal chamber with um, God, one must re remove one's veil. And um, I think that's what happened with Elsie. I mean, she was a spiritualist medium. And uh, oh, if any of you are wondering, there's bound to be the odd person, uh, you know, that uh, it was Elsie Wheeler that gave birth to the Sabian symbols in 1925 in a park in San Diego, in Balboa Park. She was with um, uh, Mike Edmund Jones, who was an ast astrologer, brilliant man, uh, and he got together with Elsie Wheeler and um, he had 360 three inch by five inch white cardboard index cards and on the back of each one he put a degree of the zodiac Aries 1, Aries 2, Aries 3, Aries 4 all the way to Pisces uh, 30 and uh, I do feel I need to explain this a little bit you know just in case some people aren't familiar with this but uh, uh, they went to a park in San Diego and here's Elsie Wheeler t totally crippled by arthritis and this is in 1925 and um you know, she would have had to have had a nurse with her and there would have been, you know, a lot of constraints on that day, you know. I mean, I'm, I know that Elsie couldn't have just jumped up and gone, well, I need to go to the toilet, you know, we'll be back in five minutes. I mean, you know, it's, it, you know, it was a major thing. So her nurse must have been present during that day. Her nurse's name was Pearl Calpin. And uh, I've done a bit of research into Pearl's life. She, she seemed to be a wonderful woman. And she was with Elsie for a long time. Well, certainly during her days in San Diego most of the time there. So 
the bride with a veil snatched away, you know, I mean, um, and just to give you, you a, you know, an indication of how that degree could work, it's the degree of the sun today, um, September 3, um, you know, it can be about, you know, a commitment to something, a commitment to others, uh, it can be where we're forced to really show ourselves, you know, it can be where we have to own up to something or, or you know, admit to something or be okay with something or be okay with being um, somehow uncovered. Would be interesting to know, you know, she, I mean, you know, in 1920, no, it was 1930, in the census in California and San Diego, you know, uh, Elsie Wheeler, um, you know, put down her profession as being a spiritualist medium. You know, and it wasn't so un unusual. Um, and California had quite a big spiritualist uh, movement going on. And it wasn't that unusual to say that you were a spiritualist medium. Well, I didn't come across any others when I was looking through that. But, you know, it, it wouldn't, it's not, wasn't such an unusual thing because, you know, there'd been the First World War and there was a very big revival in spiritualism, you know, around that time. And she continued her work as a spiritualist medium right up until she died when she was 52 and two months and a few days old. She died after having a, a um, an operation in San Diego for intestinal obstruction. You know, she lived her entire life in a wheelchair, you know, which I always think is, you know, rather cruel in the fact that her name was Wheeler. She was the youngest of five children and um, there was quite a gap between her and the, um, and the one above her. Makes me think, you know, um, uh, that her parents... Uh, you know, they must have been so tired, you know, that's my feeling, you know, it was, she was born in 1887, you know, and, and uh, in Norris City in southern Illinois, and, and in those days, you know, it was quite a thriving town. Uh, now it's a ghost town with, you know, rusted hulks of uh, silos and, and cars and, and detritus, and it's not uh, a very welcoming place. I did go there to look for more evidence of Elsie and had some very interesting experiences while I was there. I was only there for a few days. Um, well, that was long enough and, uh, you know, to have some extraordinary experiences, as I usually do, is part of my life. And so, where am I? So, Elsie was from five children and they were a farming uh, family and they were very poor. And uh, so, Elsie's mother died when Elsie was, oh, she was about five. I should get these uh, dates out, but it doesn't really matter at this point. Um, I just got this urge to do this and, and I'm just pulling this out of my head. But um, she, uh, the father must have known he was dying because he assigned the guardianship of Elsie, who was like by the time he died, like he was seven. She was seven or, yeah, I think she was seven or eight when um, the father died, Willis Wheeler. The mother's name was uh, Louisa Wheeler. The mother's maiden name was Louisa Hill, which I found to be very interesting. More about that later. But, um, yeah, so uh, Elsie's father assigned guardianship to Elsie's step-great-uncle. So not even really blood. So that was a bit weird. And a friend of mine, Laura Lukens, lovely lady from St. Louis, she, uh, she discovered... Um, this was great, um, that um, the man who became Elsie's guardian uh, was a murderer, basically. He murdered two people. And uh, so I'm not exactly sure. Uh, he'd already killed someone by shooting them in the stomach uh, some 20 years previously in the street. And um, it, it seemed he didn't go to jail for that because... I looked him up in the census very soon after, and there he was at home. So don't know what that's about. I'm sure I could find out more from the courthouse in uh, Norris City. I reckon there's more information there. Or even in Ham uh, Maybury, is it Maybury? In Hamilton uh, District there. Anyway, so Daniel got Elsie's step-great-uncle, not even a blood relationship, you know, uh, to Elsie, uh, became her guardian. And, and and Elsie was entitled to a very small pension. I, I had this visceral reaction when I first saw Daniel Gott's uh, application. Well, I, when I first heard about Daniel Gott was the day that I saw uh, through the email, I saw his application to, uh, to be Elsie's guardian. And in it, he wrote, she is a cripple. 
And then he put a line through it because I was like, you know, why do you want to look after this child? You know, what, what are your reasons for wanting to be the guardian of this child? She was a cripple, he wrote. And then he crossed it out and, she, and he wrote, she's entitled to a U.S. pension. When I read that, it was really interesting because I didn't know who Daniel Gott was. I hadn't got that far uh, when I first saw this thing. And every every ounce of me just went, oh, I can't stand this man. I had such a visceral reaction to him. And um, as it turns out, uh, he was rotting Elsie's pension, as we might have expected. And uh, uh, she was in uh, the Home for the Incurable in St. Louis, you know, in Missouri, and he was in southern Illinois, you know, collecting her pension, and, and uh, he was supposed to be sending money to the Home for the Incurables at the uh, Bethesda Hospital in St. Louis, uh, which he didn't do. Uh, apparently, he did it a few times. We found some records of that where he had actually done it sometimes. So I'm sure he did it to keep in their good graces so then he, he could fall down again. So he was rotting that. And... Um, he also, um, uh, Elsie's sister, was it Cora? Yes, married uh, into uh, the Wakefords, who were quite wealthy, and they were grain merchants, you know, from Norris City. And uh, and uh, the Wakefords, uh, there was a, uh, this Charles Wake, Wakeford, I think, from memory. Anyway, he was a doctor, and uh, he was the brother of, um, of Henry Wakeford, who was Elsie's brother-in-law. So Charles Wakeford apparently performed uh, a number of operations on Elsie. Now, I don't know what those operations were, whether it was something from her rheumatoid arthritis, but I'm talking about when she was really little. She had operations. And um, he, he didn't charge Elsie or Daniel Gott for these operations, and yet Daniel Gott charged, uh, put in a, put in a um, application for uh, monies to be paid for the um, surgeries to go to him, to go to Daniel Gott. So he was rotting on both, you know, he was rotting every, everywhere he could get. And while Elsie was in, um, and I think by now she was like 10 or 11. How old was she? Anyway, it doesn't matter. I'm going to do the chron chronology on it later. She was still young. Um, she was in the, um, the Home for the Incurables, thank God, uh, uh, because I didn't know where she was at the time that I read about how Daniel got then shot his wife through the back of the head in the bed, in her bed, in their bed. And, uh, you know, he'd been, he'd married this woman called Margaret, you know, and, and this is Daniel got, it was his third marriage. The other two wives died, I think, if I remember right, at least one of them did. So that's interesting. And, uh, and, um, anyway, he shot Margaret through the back of the head and then he said it was a, uh, robbery and uh, and then it was revealed uh, through the testimony, particularly of his 22-year-old lover. You know, and at this stage, Daniel Gott was 55 or something, um, and married to a woman 12 years older. So what's that about? You know, she probably had a lot of money. And so um, uh, the young woman, a 22-year-old who lived in the in the, I think she lived in Carmi, which is really near Norris City. Uh, she. Um, uh, had two children and had separated from her husband and was having an affair with Daniel Gott, who was, you know, 30 years older than her, maybe older, maybe 35 years older than her, and had ensconced her in a house in Carmi. Uh, pretty sure it was Carmi. It's that, that's the bigger town that's nearby Norris City. And uh, so they were going to run away together or at least be together. And uh, so her testimony, it seems to me, I did read right through the testimony, but this was in February. It'd be interesting to, you know, to read it again, to get more from it, to glean more from it. But, excuse me, Daniel ended up in hospital, uh, in, not in hospital. He, you know, well, he but it should have been in insane asylum, obviously, but he ended up in, um, in uh, jail for 15 years. Well, they brought him out of jail just, jail just before he died. Uh, by then, everything had blown over, I guess. Um so that's a bit about the Guardian. And the thing, you know, it's just astounding. So then um, Daniel Gott, even though he was in jail, continued to be her guardian and because uh, no one was standing up for Elsie to free her from this, um, I don't know, I won't use an expletive. But anyway, um, so then Henry Wakeford, who was married to, who came from this wealthy family and was married to Elsie's um uh, sister, he petitioned the court to ask for Elsie to be in his care, 
and uh, and of course that you know. But he was he was lovely. I just knew the instant I saw about this, I just went, "This is a good man, a really really good man." And um, it's interesting for, to note. Well, I think it's interesting. I was in Norris City in Illinois, you know, which Southern Illinois, which is where Elsie was born and where her family were, of course. And um, I, it's like a ghost town. It's really not somewhere you'd want to be, particularly. I, I walked along the street in Norris City, and I was going, "Well, you know, her family would have walked along these streets." You know, her family. Her mother, her father, you know, her siblings, you know, would have been on these streets. And so I was having one of those moments where you just go, wow, tune in. And I, and I saw the post office and I looked at the post office. The post office is huge in Norris City. I don't It just must have been such a hub. It's a really, you know, multi-story, big building, um, obviously over 100 years old. And I stood there and I went, wow, well, there's a building that Elsie's parents probably passed through the door of and I had no idea that Elsie's brother-in-law I didn't know at that stage that Elsie's brother-in-law was the postmaster and uh of Norris City and obviously he was in that building all the time um that he was the postmaster so anyway um then I learned uh that and this blew my mind uh that Henry Wakeford had been shot and killed and uh, Elsie by the stage was like 15 years old or something. She's in the home for the incurables still. She was there for 29 years. And you can't imagine being in the home for the incurables in St. Louis uh, with people dying around you, um, people that you've got very close to dying around you as well, people of all ages. There were a lot of older people. but There were children there, but mm, it was a lot of older people. So I think Elsie spent a lot of time with people who were terminally ill and much older. So, you know, a, a fertile ground for a spiritualist medium. So Henry Wakeford, how he got shot, I mean, this blew my mind, excuse the pun. Um, Henry Wakeford, it was reported in the Carmi newspaper uh, that he'd gone to Carmi and he'd called out the marshal. No, he ended up in an argument with the marshal in a pub, in a hotel. And... Uh, and uh, they had this huge argument and they agreed to meet, I think it was at four o'clock that afternoon, uh, where they uh, proceeded to shoot each other. That's how grown men work it out in the Wild West, I guess, with guns. And uh, they shot each other and both died. Both died soon after. So Wakeford was dead. Actually, I think Elsie was about 18 by then. So I think her guardianship, that's right, I think I saw that, her guardianship, you know, had, had, you know, uh, by, uh, by Henry, by Henry Wakeford, um, had finished up. And um, Elsie was still there uh, until 1923. She moved to San Diego. Now, I don't know how she got to San Diego. I have no idea how she got to San Diego, but a lot of people from that area of the United States were um, migrating to California. You know, it was the, you know, it was the promised lands, you know. Um, yeah, so a lot of people went to California, not that unusual. So she went there and she lived in um, Mission Hills and uh, I love it's Mission Hills. I've got whole stories around all these stories. All these stories, you know, there's more stories that happen around the stories. It's quite extraordinary. Anyway, um, so she moved to Mission Hills and she moved in with a divorcee that was 15 years older than her and his name was Frank Baxter and he was a barber. And uh, on the uh, census in 1930, uh, it's listed that he was the um, uncle <laughs> And she was the niece, just the two of them in the house there. Um, and from all of my researching, which has been extremely extensive, uh, there is no link uh, between LC and Frank Baxter in their um, family. This is none. And, and uh, so <clears throat> that's a great thing. Uh, why I say that is because I think this was a romantic relationship that was completely out of bounds, if you know what I mean, in like the 1920s in California, um, you know, with a woman who was confined to a wheelchair uh, with rheumatoid arthritis and he was a divorcee 15 years older than her. Now, why I think this was probably a real relationship, or at least it might not have been sexual, I mean, as if we would know, um, but uh, they moved uh, from house to house together and uh, they are buried together. And, uh, you know, on the uh, on my page on, on my website, I, I have the... Um, 
the little boxes where their ashes were because I visited the mausoleum where, you know, I only expected to see Elsie Wheeler and there was Frank Baxter right next to her. And so I went, oh, he died 10 years after Elsie died. So he lived another 25 years longer than, than Elsie and he got hit by a bus. Um, very sad. Uh, that was when they lived on India Street. Well, that was 10 years after Elsie died of, you know, the complications of surgery. So, yes, <clears throat> I mean, all of this story just blows my mind. And, and you know, here I am, Linda Hill from Australia, and, and uh, you know, so deeply in, engrossed in the study of the saving symbols and so deeply engrossed in, in investigating Elsie Wheeler. Um, you know, it's wild. You know, I, I had the good fortune, I'm not bragging, but, you know, why not tell the story? I had the good fortune of having lunch with Louise Hay in Balboa Park. She lives so close to Balboa Park, you can't live any closer. So that was wild. She came to my lecture um, in uh, Encinitas. Apparently, she goes to quite a few astrology lectures there. So I don't, you know, it wasn't that special that she came, but it was special to me that she came. And so we ended up having lunch in Balboa Park, just me and Louise. And uh, anyway, that was fabulous. She, what a wonderful woman. Oh, what an inspiration. But anyway, um, she said to me as we were walking up from her place, we were walking into Balboa Park, and she said, how does it feel to be the one that's doing all this with the saving symbols? And I said, I don't know. It sort of feels like God said, okay, here we go. Oh, you, over there, you are going to be the one that, you know, has to do this thing. Not has to, that will. <laughs> I mean, it's been a will, not a has to. Although I must say, I've walked away from a few times in my mind. You know, I've gone, oh, I could be selling real estate. I could actually be making, you know, decent money uh, to support all this instead of, you know, you know, uh, struggling to uh, to continue because uh, these researchers have cost me an enormous amount of money anyway. But that's beside the point. But the thing is that um, I've walked away from it a few times, and then I've gone, oh no, I can't walk away. I have to come back. So <clears throat> it's been like, you know, I think one day was like a day that I went, no, I'm not doing it anymore. It's like, oh, okay. Somehow or another, there's some sort of karmic thing going on here. And many people suggest that I'm the reincarnation of Elsie Wheeler. And, you know, I mean, I don't get involved in the glamour of that. I'm not interested in the glamour of any of this, Um, you know, in terms of like, oh, you know, how great am I, you know, that this is my, um, it's, it's much more, I think, that we live in some sort of holographic reality. And, you know, somehow or another, I was, you know, pinged, uh, to be doing this thing. I must say that my chart and Elsie Wheeler's is, are extremely like, oh, it's just all happening between my chart and Elsie Wheeler's. And when I first saw Elsie Wheeler's chart in Mark Edmund Jones's 1953 book, The Sabian Symbols in Astrology, I must admit that I my jaw fell open uh, probably for a few days. You know, it was just like, oh, bah, okay. Uh, you know, because um, the ascendant degree that Mark Edmund Jones had in there. And I do suspect he probably rectified the chart. I don't think Elsie would have known what time she was born. But Mark Edmund Jones, you know, I mean, he was a master astrologer. And the ascendant was uh, the exact degree of my moon. Uh, I think it was one minute off. I'm not talking degree. I'm talking minute. I'm talking minuscule. I'm talking like a second off my moon. And I'm born smack on the full moon and so that means that my sun sits on her descendant my moon is on her ascendant my sun sits on her descendant and there's a lot of other things besides and I'm but I'm not here to talk about mm, my situation here although I do feel to mention and I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention you know that when I was in southern Illinois and I was looking you know for evidence of Elsie Wheeler's family when I came across her mother's name it was just written with the initial uh, L and then the last name her maiden name L Hill and so yeah that that had me going oh well that's curious you know because that happens to be my name and uh so Louisa Hill of course you know and Louisa wasn't you know in the 1800s it wasn't you know as common a name no it was a much more common name like Linda wasn't really around you know but Linda Louisa hmm very similar especially the hill bit um so it was a few days later that I found Elsie's um maternal grandmother's name and that was written Helen Hill and that actually probably had a stronger I probably had a stronger reaction to that one because when um uh my daughter was born you know my my then husband Richard and I I don't know if it was me or him I suspect it was me but huh, I can't remember I uh said you know we're going to call her Jessica Helen Hill 
And so our daughter's name, middle name is Helen, you know, my daughter is Jessica Helen Hill and Elsie Wheeler's maternal grandmother's name is Helen Hill. And, um, and I said to Richard, I remember this vividly, I said to Richard, one day we're going to know why we called her Helen. So there I was in southern Illinois, a long way from Sydney, Australia, and there it was on the birth record, you know. Well, it was one of the records I found. Added to that, you know, was the Elsie Willow living with Frank Baxter in California, you know, uh, when I was 10 or 11, I asked my mother if I, and I didn't know anything about the saving symbols. Um, I wasn't even into astrology at all then, you know, I was 10 or 11. I asked my mother if I could change my name by deep pole to Baxter. Um, the reason I did was because my mother had married a man called Baxter. And so my mother married a man called Ian Baxter. And they had a child, uh, Joanne Baxter, who's my lovely half-sister. And uh, they were Baxters, you see. It was mum, you know, she was a Baxter. It was my stepfather was a Baxter. My sister was a Baxter. And I wanted to be in the club. Anyway, my mother mumbled something about it being, you know, too difficult or, I don't know, paperwork, money. I don't know. But uh, anyway, um, I think also I seem to remember thinking that, you know, it might upset my father to not be a Rigby anymore you know so anyway that was put to rest but how weird that I wanted to change my name to Baxter and Elsie Wheeler was living with um, Frank Baxter um, my mother uh, my mother's marriage to Ian Baxter lasted for a number of years and then she was single again and now she's married to a lovely lovely man whose name is Frank and uh, so I have both Frank and Baxter as my uh, stepfathers <laughs> That's wild. And, uh, yeah, so there's more. Um, Frank Baxter in in, uh, in uh, San Diego, uh, his birthday was the same day as my father's. It just goes on and on. You know, there's, I've got heaps and heaps of these. I was, in, I was in Hamilton County, you know, where the big courthouse is there, and, and I was looking for more papers to do with Elsie. And uh, I walked in to this, um, no, it was the library, the library. I walked into the library and I said to the woman, hi, my name's Linda, I'm from Australia, I'm researching, you know, I'm looking into genealogy. And she said, oh, my my um, my daughter's name's Linda. And, and she said, do you spell it with a Y? And I said, yes, I do. And she said, oh, wow, that's wild because, you know, was, you know, so we had that conversation about the spelling of the name. And then she said, oh, my other daughter's name, I have two daughters. She said, my other daughter's name's Karen. And I went, well, my name's Linda Karen. So... <laughs> It was like that. It was just like, you know, it was like, you know, and of course we know that some are highly significant and some are on the edge of the story in a manner of speaking, in, like in that Oryx story. I have many people saying that they think I'm Elsie Wheeler and, you know, probably a few people watching this, you know, might think, wow, well, Linda is the reincarnation of Elsie Wheeler and there's a few things that, you know, might make me think that, but I'm really not into the glamour of that and there's no way for me to know. And so it's interesting. Hmm. And every time I, you know, do a, a lecture, you know, I've done 29 lecture tours of the States, so I've spoken a lot more in the States than I've spoken in Australia. I mean, it's, you know, I've done extensive, you know, lecturing there on more more conferences and lectures and workshops than I can possibly remember. But um, so, you know, I have this affinity with the United States, so that's all part of the story as well. And I always have people coming up and saying, Elsie was standing next to you, Elsie was there, you were Elsie, you know, um, all of this sort of stuff. Anyway. I think it's really interesting and it's worth bringing up, I guess. You know, the, all this stuff, it's sort of like it makes us go, well, and maybe there's a bribe with a veil snatched away as well. Maybe I'm behind that. You know, maybe I'm somewhere behind that. I have no idea. And we don't know how this works, but it all sounds really great. Um, so what I, I want to talk about Elsie's chart a little bit. Now, on her ascendant is this fabulous degree. It's the... Um, it's the, uh, I've got it here somewhere. I've got her chart memorized, but I want to just have it here up so I can see it as we're going along. Um, she, uh, <clears throat> is that it? Yes. So uh, her ascendant degree was a, a woman past the age of life experiencing a new love. You know, it's my moon. And I, I see my, my new love in life. You know, it's like, you know, it's when you... Um, uh, pick up things like the saving symbols that impassions your life. You know, that's what that degree is about. It's a 28th degree of Taurus and it's Elsie's ascendant. And the woman past the age of life experiencing a new love, you know, she spent all those years. I mean, she was 36 or something before she came to something like that, before she came to uh, California uh, and met uh, Frank. 
So pretty amazing. And um, and she did things for very little money. And the karmic condition of her ascendant is the um, the Indi Indian woman selling beads and trinkets. That's Taurus 27. You know, and the thing was that, you know, I'm, I feel certain that she charged very little for her readings, you know, that she did in Mission Hills. She advertised every week in the newspaper there for years and years and years, her psychic readings, uh, her spiritualist uh, mediumship uh, readings, and also uh, her Bible lessons, which I find really interesting. Um, I'm a bit of a heretic. I'll always be a heretic uh, unless I have some big conversion on the on the edge of some river. Uh, it's extremely unlikely. But, um, but yeah, so all of that. I don't think she charged much is what I'm saying. And the karmic condition of her ascendant is the, the woman um, selling beds and trinkets. The degree following her uh, ascendant is the two cobblers working together at a table. And this really speaks about, this is really quite something, this really speaks about um, working with God. It's not always about working with God. You know, it's about partnership. It's about having a relationship. It's about, it's about having love in your life. It's about having someone that's there with you, a partner that, you know, might bring slightly different tools. You might have very similar tools, but you might, you know, he might have the hammer and you might have the chisel, <laughs> you know, because, you know, you're cobblers at a table and you bring the tools and the expertise and uh it's very interesting as dane raja uh pointed out you know it's like cobblers you know they repair shoes and the shoes are a symbol of understanding and the cobblers are there to repair the soul and so by repairing the soul we repair the understanding and the ability to you know take part in that elsie's descendant you know which is the part of the chart that talks about marriage and uh well the other the other uh is um the Sabian symbol for that is the um, mm, 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 the king of the fairies approaching his domain. You know, and, you know, it's how would she have known? You know, like where her domain was. You know, I mean, everybody died. I'm not kidding. Before she went to, well, when she went, I don't know how old she was when she went to St. Louis, but she was like four or five or six, and um, when she first went, and um, but everybody died. Her grandmother, her sister, who was married to Henry Wafer, their child died. Um, and this is like, I mean, everybody, everybody around her died. Um, she only had a niece. And she had five. I, I, I can't find Charles and Edward for the life of me um, where they ended up. I've done a lot of that. But Charles and Edward Wheeler, very common names. It was hard to find them. Anyway, the king of the fairies approaching uh, his domain is on her descendant. And so the next degree on from that is the um, the next degree on from that is the Indian woman pleading to the chief for the lives of her children. But that is my son degree because I have a son, my son is on her descendant exactly, and my you know it's only minutes off, uh, and uh, my moon is exactly to the minute on her ascendant. So. Um, yeah, so the woman pleading to the chief for the lives of her children is very much about being an intercessor. You know, it's somebody who prays for someone or brings relief to someone who says, you know, if there's someone who needs help, you know, it's the it's the go between between God and this other person. So it's a lovely one. It's very much about you know court cases and judges that are and um, and and judgments, I guess. Um, I'm not Catholic, that's for sure, um, but. Uh, I don't know what denomination Elsie was. I still haven't been able to find out. I reckon I will, though. I reckon that's going to come. I'd love to know. She was obviously uh, religious, but, you know, when she was in San Diego and doing Bible classes, it'd uh, be interesting to know what sort of Bible she was using. That would be fascinating. Um, you know, with spiritualist medium sort of stuff, you know, it wasn't, uh, you know. Anyway. I'll figure that out sometime or another. But she was an intercessor. You know, that's what it was her job, you know, to be an intercessor. The rheumatoid arthritis is interesting. I think it's her Saturn-Mars conjunction in the third house, right smack on the IC, on the third house side of the IC. You know, and her Mars in her chart is in Leo. And uh, it's on the seventh degree of Leo. And it's an old-fashioned woman brought face-to-face -face with an up-to-date girl. And it's interesting because there, she, you know, there she was, you know, living with Frank Baxter and, you know, out of wedlock and he he was a divorcee. I mean, that's, a you know, double whammy of don't do it. Um, I don't think she really cared. I had an amazing reading by this woman called Barbara when I was in San Diego 
wonderful, wonderful, wonderful 80-year-old woman, and uh, she didn't know who Elsie Wheeler was. She didn't know who I was, and obviously, and um, but, you know, I, you know, I went to her for a reading, and very soon after the reading started, I said, you know, were Elsie and Frank together in a sexual relationship? And what came straight through, she said, I thought you'd never ask, she reckons that Elsie said. And she said, yes, we were, the, you know, the forerunners of this type of relationship. So I went, oh, okay. Anyway doesn't really matter whether they're having a sexual relationship or not and of course that's their private business but 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 it is it's it's tantalizing you know and there's there's Elsie's Mars and Leo on the you know the old-fashioned woman brought face to face with the up-to-date girl goodness knows that Mar Mars is conjunct Saturn and the Saturn is on the second degree of Leo Mars is on the sixth degree of Leo and they are conjunct, and oh, I think that that is the rheumatoid arthritis playing through because there can be a lot of frustration and a lot of, you know, tension and a lot of, you know, difficulty that can come with that degree. There can also be focused effort. You know, it can be really good for being a builder or something, you know, but her her satin is on the, um, the epidemic of mumps, and uh, the epidemic of mumps, you know, is very much about... Um, disease or illness or things getting out of control so I think as it's her satin you know there's this feeling of really wanting to keep it together now the degree following her uh satin is the uh the woman having a hair bobbed that's the third degree of Leo and that speaks very much also about her modern day um thoughts about uh living with someone or marriage or whatever fabulous <clears throat> They say about her, it was written in, in an obituary about her, that she was extremely kind and she was so giving. And she used to go every Saturday to the indoor sports club, um, which was a sports club for handicapped people. And apparently she used to get around in her wheelchair. Oh, I'd so love to be able to see it. And she used to, um, oh, wait, this always cracks me up. This is interesting. The second time I've had this reaction, uh, she would uh, put her hand gnarly gnarly sort of you know rheumatoid arthritis hand on um someone's you know on their arm or something they're all handicapped and she would say no matter how hard life gets uh, there's always something to live for and um i mean her struggles were epic they weren't little they were major she had intestinal obstruction for 10 years before she died of the operation that uh, took her out she died three days or two days after she had the operation or three days after. On November 26, 1938, uh, at Scripps Hospital, I think it was. Anyway, San Diego. So another thing about her, uh, so she's the sun in Virgo. She's on the 12th degree of Virgo, and that is the, uh, the bride's uh, vow uh, snatched away. Her moon is on a degree that's always fascinated me. It's the last degree of Pisces and it's the uh, a majestic rock formation resembling a, um, a face is idealized as an, uh, by a boy as his ideal of greatness and as he grows up he begins to look like it. It's a hell of a long symbol. I apologize. I must write that uh, in a shorter fashion but it's the great stone face and so it really talks about how Elsie would look. Um, no, no, no. It talks. It's a story about a Nathaniel Hawthorne. Now, Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote a book. I'm getting complicated now, and I don't need to. Uh, you know, but, uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote a book about um, a young boy who grew up under Mount McKinley or Mount Rushmore. I think it was more like Mount McKinley. You know, one president in the hill, and uh, grew up uh, under this face, and would take that face as his ideal of greatness. And he thought, thought to himself, this. This, you know, president came from his village, and so he would look up at this uh, visage of this uh, uh, president uh, with the idea that he too could become president, and uh, he did. And that's in the story by Nathaniel Hawthorne. So Elsie's uh, Elsie Wheeler's, you know, moon to be on that very last degree of Pisces, I find to be incredibly evocative. You know, it's before Aries kicks in and it takes off in the whole thing. It feels like it contains everything, you know, because Pisces does contain everything in so many ways. You know, it's the ocean and it's so many things all mixed in. And the last degree of Pisces, you know, is going to contain so much of the whole sequence of what went before. And what and I, I found this cusp of the last degree of Pisces and that first degree of Aries, you know, in the great round as we go around, um, to be extraordinary. 
It's mind-boggling to me. Um, the first degree of Aries is a woman emerging from the ocean. Um, uh, a seal embraces her, and this is like the Selkie myth from Ireland. Uh, I won't go into that. But um, but uh, anyway, so but the thing is that Pisces is the ocean, you know, and you you know you're coming out of Pisces into Aries, and you're coming out of the ocean into conscious awareness. And of course, Aries is more about um, uh, being in control of one's life and um, and uh, having it together and being on the earth. I don't know whether being in control of one's life is such a, a good uh, experience um, expression of Aries. But anyway, it's not quite as, you know, about, about life as Pisces is, you know, because it's like we're climbing ashore under what's real, you know, again, in Aries from the ocean. So the first degree, I'm sorry, my brain went, you know, the first degree of Aries is, you know, the woman uh, climbing ashore, uh, climbing out of the ocean, she always, no, 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 that's the Leo one, uh, the seal embraces her. So the seal embraces her through through love she's, you know, brought onto the uh, onto the shore, out of the ocean. So why I'm so impressed with all that is just, you know, it's <laughs> just, um, Elsie Wheeler and Mark Evan Jones, when they gave birth to the Sabian Sybils, did not do it in a, in a fashion of like Aries 1, Aries 2, Aries 3, Aries 4, knowing what those uh, signs or degrees were. T totally double blind, had no idea what they were giving birth to. Um, well, not really, until they put it all together. Well, not so much she didn't put it together. Mark Evan Jones put it together, but Jones used Elsie as the, um, oh, there's got to be a word for that, and I should know it, the vehicle for what he called the ancient mind matrix to come through Elsie Wheeler. I want to say something else about that. Um, I went right, you know, so... <clears throat> The ancient mind matrix that came through Elsie Wheeler is, was said by Mark Edmund Jones in, nine, in the 1920s to have been from the Sabian Brotherhood who um, were in um, Mesopotamia 2,000 years ago. Uh, for the one of another word, they were alchemists. They weren't quite alchemists, but that'll do for now. And uh, they built temples out to Saturn and uh, they made uh, all sorts of um, talismans. They made talismans. And, uh, the, you know, they worshipped the planets and they were star worshippers, basically. That's the word that they put with the Sabians. And what blows my mind about this story for myself is that in 1976, I had this, in, well, it was 1975, it started, I had this insatiable, insatiable desire to go to the Middle East and to go to Iraq and to go to Jordan and Iran and Syria and Turkey, and so I found one of those overseas, you know, trips, and this particular one was the second bus to ever go through Iraq after they opened the borders there, and this is right around the time of the Iran-Iraq war, although it didn't worry me, I just went, I didn't care, I loved it, and uh, when I got to Jordan, you know, it was just really weird, and I'm in Petra, the most beautiful place I think I've ever been, in terms of history, um, I went into the... Um, amphitheater and thank god for bringing me home now that was weird i was 22 um it's like well, really uh, you know i i you know there's you know it's just like i was completely like oh okay this is bizarre and that night you know when we were all sitting in our tents you know just outside petra you know outside the ancient city of petra um i said oh, i'm going back down there tonight i have to sleep in the treasury so uh i picked up my uh sleeping bag and my lilo and started to trudge the couple of kilometres or two miles or whatever it is um, through the Sikh to get to the the treasury in in uh, in, in Petra, where uh, the full moon was shining into the doors of the treasury. If you're familiar with the treasury in in Petra, it, it's my, it was mind boggling, and we were allowed to do that at that stage. They they they'd left the, the guy with the Pepsi concession stand had left all these things there, so uh, we nicked a couple of bottles of Pepsi, which I think that they can down the road with you know they they bottled it down the road with a couple of ants in it i think but anyway that was all right so you know it's like there's something here for me now i was walking through new york several years later with robert zola bob zola who is an incredible uh, scholar in astrology latin scholar and he said but don't you realize linda he said the sabian alchemists were the the nabataeans of petra were the were the forebears of the sabian alchemists you know when they deserted petra they went north and a bunch of them went to haran in turkey and i went within 100 kilometers of that 
Well, maybe it could even be 50. I, mean, I, I was so close to where the Sabians were in 1976 and had no idea. And I had no idea that the Nabateans were the forebears. Anyway, so there's something going on here that is very special, magical, and strange. And that's good. <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it? You know, it's like, well, what do you do with that, though? I don't know. It doesn't really matter what you do with it. You just enjoy it, I guess. But Mm, makes me really want to go back there. And then they've called, they've found that 12,000 year old site, which is Go, go, uh, go for Pelly or something. Go, oh, I've never really tried to say it. But anyway, that's right near Iran. It's like 30 kilometers from Iran where it's you now 12,000 year old culture being found there and all these amazing things, you know, temples and, you know, sculptures and blah, blah. So I just hope ISIS doesn't get there and screw that up. Is screwing up the Middle East enough as it is and it's been a very emotional day you know thinking about all that anyway I don't want to get into that because it's too upsetting but um yeah something else that uh what was I going to do there oh yeah yeah her moon mm. I don't know if I'll continue to do too much of Elsie I think this is getting too long but I, I I guess I wanted to do a tribute to Elsie Wheeler and you know the North Node has been going over Elsie Wheeler's Venus degree her Venus degree and this is mind-boggling in terms of her giving birth to the Sabian symbols and being a, a spiritualist medium her Venus degree is the sixth degree of Libra and the Sabian symbol is a man watches his ideals taking a concrete form before he's in a vision and her Venus is right on the edge of the supergalactic center in Libra the degree before her Venus, the karmic condition of her Venus is the, um, excuse me, a man teaching the true inner knowledge of the new world to his students. And I think that really, those two things of her Venus there are really something. You could, you know, her Venus was retrograde and here I am at the end of Venus. I'm here doing this with Venus uh, stationary direct after it's been retrograde for a as we say, 40 days and 40 nights, and that's all a bit biblical as well. But, um, yeah, and the degree following her Venus, you know, the quest symbol, and I'll be doing more about all of this, and I can do I can do another one where I focus extensively on Elsie's chart. But the degree following, you know, the Venus is um, um, a woman feeding chickens and protecting them from the hawks, and I think that was part of her job too. She was so kind and caring. I just know this. I mean, you look at her photo, it's enough. She had Neptune on the Ascendant if Mark Edmund Jones got her chart right. I believe that she did. I'm sitting with it. But, um, I, again, I look, I couldn't even find a birth record for her. Um, she must have known what date she was born, you know, for the, all those, the papers and stuff like that to go to the home for the incurable. She would have, you know, along the way had her birthday, uh, you know, uh, confirmed. But uh, I couldn't find a birth record. Uh, they said there was none. And quite a few people didn't have birth records um, in those days in Norris City, in that area of uh, southern Illinois. So not that unusual. Don't know if there's anything else that I want. Well, she had Neptune on the Ascendant. And, you know, the, the, her degree of Neptune, you know, I and mean, Neptune is that dreamer. It's the one that can break down the boundaries between here and there, you know, the spiritual one. Um, you know, spiritual, uh, well, they're all spiritual. All the planets are spiritual. All the signs are spiritual. All the degrees of zodiac are spiritual, um, as well as being physical and emotional. Um, but Neptune has this particular bent, you know. It's like, you know, it's more of that, you know, uh, uh, you know, breaking down the barriers, the borders, and, you know, and, and, and pushing on through, and uh, it's all very mystical. So her Neptune uh, is the glass-bottom boat that reveals undersea wonders, and... Uh, and, that, and, you know, the glass bottom boat that reveals undersea wonders is, you know, it, it's one of the most clairvoyant degrees in the whole 360. There are others. There are others. But this one always stands out to me. And, uh, and the you know, the first degree of Gemini, the glass bottom boat. It's having those goggles. It's like having spectacles. It's like having those lenses, you know, that allow you to see into something that you, you would not normally be able to see into. Interesting to note that the degree after her Neptune, the second degree of Gemini, which inherently is not a, a, a bad degree or anything, but it is the Santa Claus degree, he's dispensing gifts, you know, and I, when you look at the idea of, you know, Daniel Gott and what he did in her life, you know, he was stealing her, he was stealing her gifts. He was coming in in the darkness and, you know, with his sack, and putting her gifts and her good things into his uh, sack. So, uh, yeah, hmm. it was very curious for me to have such a visceral reaction to him. I still don't like him, probably never will, or maybe I have to forgive him, but I don't care about that. It's not my job. 
I'll do more on Elsie Wheeler, I think, but I want to uh, celebrate Elsie with you. And if you've stuck in this long, then you're, <laughs> you've got stickability. I do tend to go on. But these stories are so long. I mean, where would I stop? I'm already stopping ahead of time. There's already there's things, there's more I could say. So it's sort of like um, maybe an in installments or something. I don't know. I'll get it together. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that, and I uh, have to go back. I have to figure this out. You know, I haven't been making many of these sort of things. So I'm going to turn this thing off now, and uh, I hope you enjoyed that, and uh, tune in for more fabulous Sabian Simple Antics. Bye.